Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Craig Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. Well, today on Beyond the Art, we have a Indigenous Hawaiian uh, with us today. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about your personal background and cu- your cultural heritage? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Lehua Uwakea. I am a Native Hawaiian artist and bark cloth maker. I was born in Portland, Oregon, and um, raised on my ancestral homelands in Hawaii on the Big Island, um, east side, a small town called Papaiko. Used to be a sugar plantation town, um, still pretty small. Um, and for those of you who might not be familiar with um, bark cloth, um in my culture we call it kapa or you may have heard tapa um it's a non-woven textile made from the bark of certain trees and um, it's a very labor-intensive process that requires um pulling the bark off the inner woody part of the tree and through several weeks of uh, pounding and soaking and fermentation it becomes transformed from rigid tree bark into um something that's kind of a cross between cloth and paper. So we'd use this for ceremony, for bedding, for traditional clothing, um, and also now for contemporary art. Um, so uh, so yeah. uh, what does your, mean, your name mean in your native language? It's a beautiful name. Um, yeah, there's multiple meanings. Um, the direct translation is it refers to the the white misty rain condensing on the lehua flower. Mm-hmm. Um, but in our culture, we have so many different um, layers of meaning. They're they're called kona. So what you see on the surface, the direct translation isn't always the the full the true, um, right the full picture. <laughs> Right, right. So how has your Native American identity, Hawaiian identity, influenced your artistic work? Yeah, um, you know, when I first started out um, doing this practice um, a few years ago, I was uh, finishing college. um, And, you know, I kind of did the standard like painting and drawing route, um, wasn't really expressing um my cultural heritage too much through my work it was very um kind of stripped down and assimilated um and then I realized there was a void and so I you know one thing led to another I started apprenticing um with a bark cloth making master Wesley Sen for those on the island of Oahu and um ended up just kind of taking over my entire practice so that's kind of um the main thing that I do now mainly what I'm known for even though I do kind of step outside of that occasionally and do installation and um, Mm. mixed media painting but for the most part even if it's a completely different medium it's still informed by the patterns I use or um kind of like my cultural background and our oral histories and um, mythologies and things like that. So was there anything in particular that uh, inspired you to become an artist? And were there any specific experience or moments that sparked your creative journey? Um, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've always been, you know, I've always leaned more towards the creative side. Um, um, drawing as a kid with crayons, obviously. Um, yeah, and when I was kind of trying to figure out what I where I wanted to go with um, like the college route and all of that, I right. initially was um, starting off on a path to become a neonatal nurse. Um, so caring for newborns, um, especially uh-huh. I wanted to work in the NICU. So newborns who um, maybe were premature or just 
had certain defects at birth that needed extra attention. Um, Mm -hmm. I really wanted to do that. And um, kind of when I was around uh, the time of graduating high school, I realized that wasn't for me um, going through a lot of like personal family stuff at the time. And I realized I didn't want to be headed towards a career that I wasn't a hundred percent invested in. And Mm so I kind of did a whole 180 and (laughs) backed out of nursing school and um, went to art school. So. Well, we thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Because you do have uh, beautiful pieces of work. Uh, Tell us about your artistic process. How do you choose your subjects and mediums and how do you approach your creative work? Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on, uh, the project and the story that I'm trying to tell Mm -hmm. when it comes to bark cloth. Um, a lot of what I work with is dictated by the medium itself. So, um, you know, trees are only a certain size. So therefore the bark that they offer to make the bark cloth or the kappa is, um, I wouldn't limited. say limited, but it's, yeah. it, it's, it's dictated to a right. certain size. Um, and then the pigments that I use, they're all natural like earth pigments that I mm-hmm. gather myself. And so, um, again, like those maybe don't have the flexibility that something synthetic like acrylics might have. Um, although I do think that there's a lot of ways to push it right. uh, to, to further limits. Um, in terms of subject matter, um, I kind of touched on it earlier, but a lot of that is dictated by, um, like, the mythologies, you know, mythologies. They're, they're true mm-hmm. histories, you know, oral histories that um, are about our deities, about our place names, um, how those stories came to be. Um, yeah, and it, it all kind of relates back to... Um, our identity, both cultural and communal and personal as native Hawaiians. So in those stories, are those very indicative of each individual Island or is it all collective within the the cultural element of the Hawaiian islands? Um, both. Both. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, there's, there's so, you know, we are a small, relatively small Island nation. Um, but within those islands, there's very different, um, communities that while we're all connected, we're also very distinct. And like, for example, um, there's different dialects of native Hawaiian language that are spoken in one area and perhaps not understood all too well in another. Um, Mm -hmm. and there's also bark cloth, um, patterns that are used in some areas that are specific to a certain, uh, community um so they're kind of distinctive in that way so yes they're they're specific and in that and that includes our stories as well um our place names obviously are specific to place but um there's collective things that we have in common and also things that um make us distinct and uh specific to a certain family line or lineage or um community is there a certain message or narrative that you're trying to extract and incorporate into your your pieces of artwork? Is there an ongoing theme? Yeah, I think um, at this point, you know, a lot of my work centers around the revival of this practice. Um, back in the 1820s is really when you start to see a slow decline and then... Mm progressing into the mid 1800s um, and late 1800s, it was um, very rapid decline and almost entire erasure of this practice. Um, So it went dormant for a while. And um, as far as my family line goes, no one's been making kappa in at least uh, seven or eight generations. Um, And that's kind of how it is across the board. There were a very small handful of practitioners who brought this back into play in the 80s and 1970s during the Hawaiian Renaissance um, and they were doing that not based on their their grandmothers teaching them or their mothers teaching them but from documentation that 
white men had created um, Mm -hmm. when they first came to our islands. And so, um, you know, a lot of that was trial and error and it's because of them that I'm able to do what I'm doing now as, as a young practitioner. Um, So a lot of it is revival. You know, we need more younger, younger people doing this so that it doesn't reach that point again where it's almost lost. Um, So beyond that revival and kind of resilience theme, um, kind of also asserting that native Hawaiians are, are still here and, um, you know, sharing, sharing the true histories of our people, which are often overlooked and misrepresented. Um, and then also as a member of the diaspora myself living here on the continent, um, I think it's also important to acknowledge and represent, um, diasporic experiences. Um, you know, not all of our people live back home on our ancestral homelands, like so many native people today. Um, and there's more native Hawaiians living outside of Hawaii than there are living on the islands now. And so there's a lot of, um, sociopolitical reasons for that. Um, so yeah. So take us through the process of actually cultivation and treatment and then creating your artwork. Mm -hmm. Um, So the process begins with um, obviously, you know, cultivating and growing the tree. Um, Mm -hmm. You can gather the material out in the wild, um, (laughs) but it's, it, it really um, is best to cultivate it because it needs constant attention and a level of, water and um precipitation or you know irrigation that's consistent right um and all of that is reflected in the final um quality of the bark itself and of course the cloth that you make from it so once um, the tree is ready to harvest around 18 months or so um it's about a inch and a half to two inches in diameter um you cut a singular slit down the entire length of the tree um and usually at this point the tree is six feet long sometimes shorter sometimes longer depending on how well it's grown um but use that single cut to pull the bark away from the inner woody stalk itself Mm -hmm. and then you peel the layers of bark away from each other so there's three layers there's the brown part the inner green part and then the white fibrous part and you don't need the brown and the green part you just need the white part um and from there it can go several different ways um throughout the whole pacific there's many different um traditions and processes of making this cloth um they're all very specific to which island or which community they're coming from right right. Mm -hmm. um in hawaii we're known for a very lengthy fermentation process that results in a very um, refined and delicate, almost tissue-like material. So um, whereas in some places like Fiji or Samoa or Tonga, the cloth is much more um, rough and and rigid. In Hawaii, where I'm from, um, the cloth becomes very smooth and and soft. And so after that, um, sometimes weeks or even... I think I've soaked things for like a month um, before yeah. um, and it becomes very um, pungent um, <laughs> and slimy. Um, that's how you know it's ready. And then uh, it is ready to be and it goes through several different layers or different processes of beating. Mm-hmm. And then finally watermarking, which is also a distinctive characteristic of native Hawaiian bark cloth. Um, and then finally on to painting and stamping printing using traditional tools so that's the easy part (laughs) that's the easy part (laughs) so when you first started was there a huge learning curve or process and understanding and as like you mentioned you know some of the uh, cultural elements and ways of doing things is continually being lost and now there's a resurgence of actually reinstituting our cultural heritage for indigenous people all over the world. So was there many people to learn from that gathered information or was there one in particular person that actually helped you along the way? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a few elder practitioners still um, working and teaching today. My primary teacher um, 
I mentioned before, Wesley Sen. Mm-hmm. He um, is actually the same person that my grandmother used to babysit um, about 60 years ago. And so they reconnected after many decades of being out of touch. And wow. um, she asked him to teach me. And so he, when I was ready, I approached him and that's how I started learning. Um, and through him, I was introduced to a few other bark cloth practitioners, mainly on the island of, o- of Oahu. Um, but most of them are, you know, in their 50s and older, um, 60s and above. And so, yeah, there, yeah, there, yes, there was like practitioners to learn from, but um, not many. And some mm-hmm. of them are getting older to where their their bodies just won't keep up with the work that they want to do because right. um, it's a very labor intensive process. So, um, yeah, like, you know, you can't buy your paints down at the store, no. you know, at the art <laughs> store, you can't buy your traditional tools um, at the art store either. So my teacher um, tasked me with making my first tool even before I started learning. Um, and so, you know, kind of learning the hard way. Um, but I think that's how it should be because it's, it's really not something that you can learn from a book or a YouTube video. You really have to just learn on the, on. on the job training, as they say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what inspires and motivates you in your creative process? Um, a lot. I think, uh, you know, I'm really inspired by so many native artists and Pacific Islander artists who are bringing back their cultural heritage through mm-hmm. um, intergener- intergenerational practices. Um, I think that's really important. Um, also inspired by our younger generations who are so um, firmly rooted in their identity, who speak their language at home and with their families, with their classmates, um, and can't be shaken to assimilate and and lose their, their heritage. Um, mm-hmm. Super inspired by that. Um, and just also just the idea of bringing this practice back to our people. You know, at one point, almost every family pre-contact had um, kapa makers. You know, they're, it was passed down um, grandmother to mother to daughter. Um, and so, you know, that, that line being unbroken is right. not something that we have these days. But, um, you know, that's not to say that we can't rebuild that. Um, and there's a few practitioners um, in Hawaii who who envision that for their future. So I think we're on a good path. Are there any particular artists, both within the Hawaiian community and beyond, who have influenced your style or perspective? That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think one of my favorite um, artists in terms of bark cloth makers um, these days is Cora Allen Wycliffe. Um, she's a Maori and Niuean bark cloth maker who comes from an unbroken line of bark cloth makers in her wow. family um, on her Niuean side. And so it's it's really beautiful to see um, her not only upholding the traditions that were passed down to her, but also innovating and continuing to create and bring um, this into a contemporary fine art sense, not just a traditional craft sense right. i think there's a line to be blurred um also my friend roken um kichocho he's a chamaru artist from gohan or guam um incredible weaver um usually weaving with pandanus or mm. hibiscus bark um just amazing another young weaver who's taken up cultural practices um beyond that i mean there's there's so many like (laughs) you know how it is right right you're always influenced by uh, what others are doing because i think it continues the evolution of indigenous art you know to Mm -hmm. having others around you and being motivated by them in your designs in your creating your bark cloth are there any designs that are always traditional are you trying to install some creative contemporary components as well yeah both um 
because you know there's there's traditional patterns that we are able to use they're called mm-hmm. noah so they're free of um social and cultural and spiritual restrictions so um there's a few patterns that you'll see on my work today that you'll also find on samples of bark cloth um from 200 years ago um but then there's other patterns that much like our tattooing are very specific to family or genealogy that you don't want to copy mm-hmm. um and even if you don't know the meaning of them um you don't want to just outright copy them because it's it's inappropriate it's it's not right um you don't know who you're borrowing or taking that design from and so we mm-hmm. we just let those patterns be um but on the other hand you know it's also important to continue innovating um and creating new traditions and um part of the whole idea and vision for bringing this practice back to my family is also creating a new library or new lexicon of patterns to continue building the craft so that um you know future generations have something that is continually um growing and being and being rebuilt and so a lot of the patterns that i use are ones that i create myself um based on the aesthetics and kind of design elements of my ancestors but using them to speak to a contemporary experience that is mine or um shared within my community do you take uh risk challenges or challenge yourself in your designs um yeah you know i think a lot of um what we're doing like what young bar cloth makers and and native wine artists these days are doing is is risky you know in a way because we want to maintain our traditional practices and and honor the the heritage and the lineage that they descend from but also Mm -hmm. um continue building and creating new things and in some ways that innovation can be scary and um risky because some of these things haven't been done before or haven't been done in many many generations and occasionally there's pushback from from the community because it doesn't fit the idea of what we should or shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a very fine line, I think, within that. Um, and then beyond that, too, it's, you know, expanding beyond um, traditional bark cloth making. Um, taking risks with other mediums is always a challenge and um, always lends itself to learning something new if you're open to it. All right. Are you... Uh experiencing the other mediums or are you sticking just to bark claw um yes and no i think um <laughs> i mean most of the time when i'm asked to do an exhibition or um taking private commissions for people it's they want bark cloth um mm-hmm. just because that's kind of what i'm mainly doing right now but also um sometimes i'm required to step outside of that while maintaining the same aesthetic or kind of vibe of, right. of the bark cloth work that I do. Like last year I did a commission for Facebook um, meta out in Seattle. Um, and they wanted something that looked like bark cloth, but was way more colorful and was going to be in a high traffic, like public area. Um and so maybe the natural dyes and earth pigments and bark cloth wasn't going to be the best medium. So I kind of had to translate those ways of working into another medium. And so I mm-hmm. ended up, um, I dyed sheets of Tyvek that I stitched together and softened to make it look like flowy, like cloth. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Um, and then I used my stamps on that and um, created this super colorful installation that ran across I think like 32 feet of wall Mm -hmm. um so that you know it it could still read as native Hawaiian but um survive a public art setting so have you faced challenges being a Hawaiian or Native American artist and how have you overcome those challenges and I guess what advice would you have to offer to other emerging indigenous uh artists yeah, I think um, 
definitely challenges. Um, one of the largest, I think, is is pushback from the larger contemporary art community. I think there's hesitation to include Native Hawaiians, whether it just be in the larger sphere of contemporary fine art or contemporary Native art. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're not federally recognized, Native Hawaiians are often excluded from applying for certain grants or fellowships. Um, We're even not allowed to participate in SWAIA, you know, like so many other unfederally federally unrecognized um, tribes in this country. And so that um, in terms of visibility and inclusion has been um, difficult, you know, understanding what I'm up against um, makes it a little easier to understand and and comprehend at least what's going on. Maybe not why, because I don't agree with it, but um, that's a thing, you know, and I think otherwise, um, a huge challenge is just being apart from my ancestral homelands, even though I go back so often um, these days. Um, it's still expensive. And right. a lot of my family is still back there. A lot of my, all my teachers are back there. My practitioners that I am, you know, growing up alongside against, um, they're all back home. And of course the trees that I need, they don't right. really grow <laughs> very well up here. So um yeah that's a challenge you know and of course the goal is to move back home soon not just to you know further my practice but also just to be with my family Mm -hmm. um and i think that's something that a lot of other native people can relate to just being apart from their their homelands or their res and being apart from their family because of that but also wanting to pursue jobs or education outside of where they're, you know, they grew up just because maybe their, their homelands don't have those kinds of opportunities, um, different opportunities, you know, so it's, it's difficult sometimes. So what, what hasn't surprised you during this creative path and journey that you've taken that you didn't expect? Um, I think the biggest surprise for me was, um, the really steep trajectory that I found myself on um, a few years ago. I've been out of school for six years, five years. Um, And within that time, my work has just kind of, um, the recognition for my work has kind of taken off and I really never expected it to to go that (laughs) like that um it really was in the last three three to four years or so um just being awarded different fellowships and getting recognition getting international exhibitions um private commissions from large institutions or um big collectors i never would have imagined um my work kind of taking off that quickly so very grateful but also it's a huge learning curve and right. um there's growing pains involved so i i, I can imagine but your your work is beautiful so you you deserve the accolades that you've been receiving thank you are there any significant uh or prominent pieces that you're most proud of to date yeah i think there's there's mainly one that comes to mind um it's called meleo na kokani wai And it means um, Song of of a Thousand Waters. Um, And that was actually the piece that I did back in 2018 when I was um, in my senior year of college in Mm -hmm. art school. And um, that was actually my my senior thesis piece. And it's this wall installation um, printed with literally thousands of imprints of traditional stamps. Um, And it's um, kind of a flowy piece that comes off the wall in certain areas and kind of undulates. It's roughly 10 feet wide by seven ish feet tall, depending on how you install it. Um, But yeah, that piece kind of launched my trajectory for not only learning bark cloth, but also um, getting a lot of recognition for my work. And also it ended up being acquired by the national gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia for their permanent collection. And wow. um, it's featured um, 
as one of their new acquisitions for the NGV Triennial, which opens in December of this year. So um, that was like my first big international thing. And then, you know, of course, they ended up acquiring it. So that's kind of a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was really exciting, though. Um, and of course, propelled me to do art full time, you know, contributed to that as well. Mm -hmm. So. So do you yeah. have a stockpile of ideas in your head that you're you're collecting or do you write everything down and kind of sketch it in, in form and saying, okay, this is this is coming up, this is I'm gonna do this and this and this? Um yeah, well on that note, you know, I do have um a very large color coded spreadsheet of like <laughs> upcoming things that I have to do. It's spelled right. out through I think the end of next year, but um in terms of ideas that I of projects that I want to do, um, they kind of just live in my head just for now because I've never really been too much of a sketchbook person. Um, and yeah, for now they just live in my head because I just have so many things going on and not much time to do them. So I feel like it's one of those cliche um, situations where there's like so many ideas, so little time. Right. <laughs> But it's, you know, it's good. I'm never like out of ideas. Well, it's a good problem to have, I guess. I think so. <laughs> so collaboration and community are important aspects of indigenous cultures. Have you collaborated with other artists or worked within your community or others within your community? And how has that impacted your art and your connection to your heritage? Yeah, I think... Um learning alongside other people can be considered like a collaboration because, you know, you're, you're doing the work together. Mm -hmm. um, and then also recently I um, kind of held an event with one of my teachers out in Oregon, um, my hula instructors who also runs the Hawaiian civic club of Oregon in Southwest Washington. Um, and we invited our community to come out and um, learn about traditional bark cloth kites and participate in the creation of um, these little bark cloth tail pieces for mm -hmm. one of the kites. So it ended up being like a collaborative kite um, and they could put anything that they wanted on it. I really invited them to um, be expressive with it and, put down their dreams or if they have prayers that they'd like to send up to a loved one, because, you know, traditionally our kites were used for, for ceremony and for contacting our ancestors and our deities. Um, so when I end up flying this kite, um, it'll kind of be the, the freeing and the celebration of all of those, those prayers and those, those thoughts and words and drawings um, from our community put together. Mm -hmm. So that was really special. Um, and that was the culmination of a grant that I got from the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. Um, so, yeah, that was really awesome. And, I mean, yeah, I can't really think of anything else right now. I, I know there's stuff, but it's just, like, coming up right now. <laughs> no worries, no worries. How do you navigate uh, the balance between honoring your cultural traditions, traditions and expressing your individual artistic vision? Yeah, I think that one's um, not always super easy. You know, I think there's a lot of expectations from my elders that um, they have certain ideas of what a young practitioner should be doing and and what giving back and carrying on this practice looks like. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it has to come in a weird roundabout way to get to that point. Um, especially if you're not living on your ancestral homelands. Right. Um, you know, there's all these opportunities like for exhibitions and institutional recognition that um, has served me well, you know, so far. And ultimately that will end up feeding back to the, the goal of moving back home so that I can be with my community and um, continue teaching and take on my own apprentices and have my own grove of, uh, you know, the paper mulberry trees that I need. But um, until then, it, it can look like um, not so 
streamlined as according to how my my teachers and my elders want it to be um and then in terms of you know just like overall subject matter I think that's a little bit easier to reconcile just because there's more um I think there's more flexibility and more openness in terms of um people wanting to express new stories and new experiences Mm -hmm. that are more relevant to a contemporary native Hawaiian experience. But again, bringing that um, cultural practice of, you know, making bark cloth, making kapa, I think um, that's easier to blend. It's a little harder to blend the, the, you know, homesteading with the big gallery (laughs) institutional exhibitions Um, that can sometimes be a little dissonant for people so where are you currently represented or showing exhibiting um yeah so i've kind of intentionally avoided gallery representation um up until this point i think for me getting um you know as an emerging artist or classified as an emerging artist just based on my how many years I've been in practice for. Um, It was important for me to establish myself first before really taking on um, representation like that. But um, yeah, I just had a show open in Australia, another Australian show, not the NGV one, um, but the Queens and Art Gallery of Modern Art, Q-A-G-O-M-A, yeah. Um, They have a show that's featuring... um, all female uh, practitioners from across the Pacific. So not just Hawaii, but um, Maori are also represented. Um, I think there's a few other people from like Fiji, Tonga Mm -hmm. as well. Um, So that's really incredible. Um, Haven't really seen any pictures of it yet, but it literally just opened two days ago. Um, (laughs) So yeah, right now I'm just working on a few um, public art commissions, some really big ones, um, installations, and um, a framed piece as well. So that's kind of occupying my time. I just got done doing the International Folk Art Market in Santa Fe in July. So that was um, a huge undertaking. It was um, kind of a big deal because I was the first Native wine to do it. So, um, you know, just representing our people and asserting that native Hawaiians, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're we're still here and we're still doing important work in the grand scheme of contemporary native art. So in what ways do you envision your art contributing to a broader understanding and appreciation of Hawaiian culture, both within and outside the community? Um, Yeah, I think within the community, um, giving back in the way that maybe I didn't have access to growing up. Um, You know, when I was a teenager, I was living back in Oregon. Um, My family moved back to the Portland metro area and being a diaspora kid um, was kind of weird because I didn't have, I suddenly didn't have all those cultural connections um, around me or people who looked like me and, Mm -hmm. um, it ended up being replaced by a lot of stereotypes and uh, racial stigmas, um, people judging me for how I looked and how I even like talk different or ate different food. Um, and, you know, growing up around kids that didn't look like me, I know exactly how young diaspora kids in the net, you know, in the younger generation, mm-hmm. how they feel. Um, and so using my work to, share our stories, but also grant them visibility and help them feel seen and heard and, and valued has been um, a huge, a huge thing for me being up here on the continent. Um, and eventually when I move back, I'll be able to take on apprentices and do workshops with kids at local schools. And, um, you know, that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, beyond the community, I think, um, kind of what I've touched on earlier is just sharing the true history of native Hawaiian people and um, also pushing against these boundaries that a lot of institutions and perceptions have boxed us into that um, traditional craft isn't, um, isn't able to cross the boundary between craft and fine art. 
Um, and just because it's traditional, it can't be contemporary. I think those two things really, um, those labels aren't necessarily always really helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot, a lot of the time they seek to box us in even further. Um, and so, you know, a huge goal for me, I think whether it's intentional or just kind of a byproduct of what I do, um, ending up, you know, just redefining what it means to be a contemporary artist who works in traditional media, um, kind of blurring the lines between the two and not having mm-hmm. people think so, so black and white. True, true. And I've said it many times on this show, just, just because there was colonization and contact at first contact doesn't mean we stopped evolving as a people. Um, you know, the indigenous community continues to grow and evolve and so does our heritage and so does our culture. So does our language and other aspects of who we are as a people. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you what's next, but you have an Excel sheet that's color coded and you kind of went over what's next, but what's next for you? Yeah. Um, besides that, I have a, um, I have a opening at the Shangri-La Museum in Honolulu. Um, I also have a bark cloth making or a bark cloth exhibition that opens in Atlanta next May. That one's going to be really cool just because um, there's two representation or two representatives from each um, included bark cloth making tradition across the Pacific. And I think um, parts of South America are included as well, which is incredible. Um, I also have a solo exhibition out in, uh, central Washington university that opens that same month. Um, yeah, there's kind of a lot of things. So (laughs) in addition to all these things that end up popping up in, in the meantime that I don't have on the calendar yet, but will inevitably find their way there. So you mentioned commissions. You have a lot of commission pieces coming up that you're working on. Yeah, like um, one of them is a public art commission that is um, for the Portland State University. They're uh, like redoing their health and science building, um, which is like this huge brutalist architecture, like concrete monstrosity in <laughs> the building or in on the campus. And they're redoing that so it's more inclusive of... Um, they're very diverse student population. And so they commissioned me to create a large installation that will be suspended um, hanging from the ceiling. So there'll be, I think the final measurement I settled on was three tapestries that are 16 feet long. Wow. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, still in the process, I have my final design review meeting in a couple of weeks. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then right now I'm, Right behind me, I'm starting a project. Um, it's a commission for Canada Goose, the the like down right. for ja- or you know <laughs> the jacket company um, uh-huh. for cold weather. They're opening a new store in Ala Moana on Oahu, and so they commissioned me as um, kind of their central artist um, to create a very large art cloth painting for them. So I've got my my agenda full, um, <laughs> but it's, it's really a good problem to have. It's not really a problem. So what's the day in the life of, for you in your studio? Um, yeah, because I work for myself, it's kind of nice. Cause you know, I get to dictate my own schedule and, um, able to travel when I need to, or when I want to, mm-hmm. um, I have chickens, so I, <laughs> <laughs> take care of the chickens. Um, well, I have one chicken now because I had to get rid of the roosters. But in the process <laughs> of getting hens, um, some more hens to keep her company, taking care of the garden, um, you know, doing the normal morning routine, and mm-hmm. depending on how I'm feeling, getting to work around. Sometimes it's ten in the morning. Sometimes it's three in the afternoon. It really depends. Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes I'll be up late working just because I have so much to get done. And sometimes I just like lately in the last few weeks, I've been able to finally take it easy a little bit after a very, very busy July. Um, and so I've just been grateful for, for the break and for 
being able to relax for a little bit before things <laughs> pick up again next month. Is there anything else you want to share with us? You want to, this is your time to promote. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I I think I touched on everything, most of the stuff in the spreadsheet other than, you know, the minutia, but <laughs> um, yeah, I guess if anyone wants to follow me, my work, um, you can just go to my website, which we might be able to plug in after the podcast um, on media material, but it's just my name.com, um, com, or you can... Um, Follow me on Instagram. It's just my name in between two underscores. Since you started this creative journey, have you seen more resurgence in your local community back home, uh, participating and being involved and also interested in continuing the, the evolution of your cultural and heritage and art? Um, yes and no. I think um, Bart Clough is, it's a little harder to, to, have long-term recruits just because it's <laughs> such a, a labor intensive process right. that requires so much, so much energy and, and attention and time and, and patience. Um, but, you know, there overall is a resurgence of our language and our cultural practices, our dance, um, our identity, our, our pride in our identity. Um, and that's really taking root in our younger generations who grow up speaking English alongside Boledo Hawaii, which is such a beautiful thing because, um, you know, our language was outlawed um, for so many generations. And, you know, in my family, like I didn't learn Hawaiian from my dad. He didn't learn Hawaiian from his parents, nor did his parents learn it from his grandparents. So, um, there is really a stigma for our language, but nowadays I think there's um, that that's breaking down. And Mm -hmm. alongside that is um, the resilience and resurgence of our, our other cultural practices practices in addition to our language, um, which is really awesome. Well, it's been an extreme pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much and much continued success for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you.